Anne, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. That's lovely. Happy Valentine's to you, too. It is happy February Valentine's 14th. Day. Hey, it is February 24th, February 14th, 2014. I hope it's and the 14th is... and not the 24th. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. And uh, yay, greeted, joined here by, by Anna Pollock and Lynn Gray for Responsible Travel Week. Uh, great to see you both. Uh, this is an unscripted conversation. We are uh, receiving our live tweets. <clears throat> and thank you to everybody who's watching, all of our two viewers. We've we're, we aspire to hide single-digit numbers in the live <laughs> in the live version uh, recorded. It should get up to a uh, hundred. Uh, Anna, great to see you again, and can you introduce yourself to the world? Hi, Ron. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, Anna Pollock. I am the founder of Conscious Travel, and uh, that's my present incarnation. And I've been a consultant, as you know, in the tourism and travel economy for longer than I care to mention. Lovely. And Lynn, introduce yourself. I'm Lynn Gray and um, Anna and I have known each other and worked together for nearly 20 years which as I said the other day makes us 35. So um, we're not doing badly at the moment. I and that's PR and I just like to connect people, encourage people and do what I can that's to do with conscious travel and responsible travel. Lovely. Um, this is Responsible Travel Week and it's all kind of, um, it, which uh, pivots around the, I want to say encircles the, the, the Valentine's Day. We've done this now for six years in a row. Uh, talk about, Tell us sweet tales of love. Uh, how do we connect love and empathy to travel and tourism? Open question. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, a couple of things come immediately to mind, and I wasn't sure what your question was going to be, but um, the aim of conscious travel, I think, um, is to enable our, our guests uh, the visitors to a place to fall in love again. Um, not only with each other, but more importantly with, with the planet that we, we call home. And by that I mean really, um, the travel could be a wonderful uh, way of, of getting people back much closer to, to Mother Earth, to Mother Nature, um, in help people come into a relationship, a better, a more harmonious relationship with, with her. I like to use the feminine there. Um, so that's, that's apropos to, to Valentine's Day. Um, I think that's really important because one of the, the fundamental concerns I've got about travel right now is that we're, we've modeled everything on this industrial model of, of things, of production and consumption of, of stuff and we've seen um, we're looking this old model looks very much at the earth as an object as something separate from ourselves mother nature is something separate something that we have to control we can manipulate we can exploit we can take stuff and make stuff and sell stuff but we don't have um, an intimate relationship with Mother Earth in that model. And that's really the fundamental reason why we're potentially going astray in both tourism and in, you know, in our economy generally. So if it's Valentine's Day, I'd like to think that we could um, see that as a way of um, rethinking our relationship perhaps with, um, with the places that we, we uh, visit and the places that we as an industry um, currently exploit in order to, um, to sell lots of holidays. Beautifully put. And I just a, a quick question: uh, How would you differentiate the difference? What's what's the difference or the connection between conscious travel and conscious business? Well, the the term conscious is quite straightforward. It sounds very grand and pretentious, but really, it's about awareness. It's about um, 
And it comes from, uh, well, I'll let you, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of how I came to use the word conscious. And it, it I was, I, as you know, I've been very much concerned about sustainability, about the growth of tourism, about issues around um, resource scarcity, climate change, and all of these things which are going to affect our industry for quite some time. And I created something called the Icarus Foundation in Canada, which was about um, educating the tourism industry there to mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change. And to be honest, we weren't having a lot of success in getting people to really um, move that high up their agenda. And so after the, the, well, after the Lehman Brothers crash and the financial crash, I started to, to look for research that would Tell me how consumers were, were perhaps reacting or changing to what was actually quite a significant uh, wake-up call. Um, and it was through, through that process, and we're talking now about three or four years ago, I came across a whole pile of research on how there was a, an acceleration of an existing trend within the Western world towards... Um, turning away from sort of mindless consumption. You may remember that expression, retail therapy, um, that was quite quite common a few years ago where people would uh, go out and shop or, or after 9-11, um, I think President Bush said, you know, you can solve this problem by all going shopping. Um, that whole idea that we just were um, consumers of stuff and that would fulfill us um, was no longer had had its appeal to an awful lot of people. And the research pointed out that, pe that many consumers were beginning to become more mindful. So instead of mindless consumption, they were beginning to think about more about their behavior. And there was an agency out of uh, New York that actually coined the expression the conscious consumer. And I came across a whole pile of other studies, all of which are on the Conscious Level website which pointed to this, this gradual shift in awareness that we couldn't just go on mindlessly con con producing and consuming stuff without bearing the consequences. So that's why I use um, the term conscious. Um, so it really is waking up to the fact that there are limits to what we can extract, exploit, manipulate, and uh, consume and then also produce in terms of waste uh, on this planet um, and waking up or becoming conscious of that is what, what is the underlying principle. Uh, obviously we'll do a lot more after that as well. Um, does that sort of address your question? I'd say that's a perfect uh, perfect unscripted answer. Lovely. Qu quite articulate. Okay. Oh. So that's where I'm coming from. It's um, uh, it's, it's utterly compatible with and of the notion of being responsible. Um, it also um, integrates, I would like to think, the whole notion of the real meaning of sustainability, which should be about living in balance. But I think that word sustainability has lost all meaning. It's been manipulated beyond recognition. Um, it also integrates the notion of, of um, the social equity side of tourism. How, how is tourism not only living in harmony with the, with the natural world, with nature, but how is tourism uh, also being respectful of and protecting and in some cases rejuvenating the cultural diversity that we have uh, so dependent, we're so dependent upon, and which we need to to um, to maintain. So there's a. The, I'm going to be speaking in South Africa to the fair trade um, people down there, who who are a little bit more focused on social equity than they are probably on environmental issues. But they're all part of the same the same um, issues. Very good. <coughs> I'd like to. Uh... Uh, I'm going to ask you, Anna, or perfect, thank you. I'd like to uh, move over to uh, welcome mm -hmm. our third guest to Ethan Gelber there in New York City. Hi, uh, Ethan, if you can, please unmute yourself and with, uh, and introduce your, your thoughts on this Valentine's Day. 
I missed whatever your first question was, but um, um, what 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 have you been discussing? <laughs> well, remember, uh, we know who you are, but other folks don't. So, uh, well, here the this reiteration of the. Sorry, say again. I said we know who you are, but some of the people might be watching for the first time. If you can, uh, let us know who you are and 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 how are you connecting uh, Valentine's Day to travel and tourism? How am I connecting Valentine's Day to travel and tourism? That's a pulpy one. Um, my name is Ethan Gelber. I am based in New York right now, having just been punished with about a foot of snow last night with some more expected tomorrow. Um, muffled thoughts of Valentine's Day, muffled by beautiful white snow. Um, my connection to the industry for about 15, 20 years, I've been writing about travel in various guises. Uh, before there were tags and special niche areas, I was writing about what has emerged and what has become the responsible, sustainable, local, ethical, certainly conscious side of the way people move about the world. Um, I do this through a number of different um, initiatives and projects, some of them more focused on writing about travel and expressing my opinions both to the industry and to consumers, and some of it helping people who do likewise through other avenues to um, reach new consumers, whether it's through uh, curation, as I've been active in promoting and pushing and developing something called Outbounding, which is a community-powered content curation uh, content curation platform, or through working with other journalists, writers, social media folk uh, in, in tandem with one instead of in competition with one another through something like Eco Adventure Media, which brings together 12 different content creators, uh, through something like the Local Travel Movement, which was an early attempt to bring together like-minded industry partners who share a belief in this responsible, sustainable, eco-conscious local space, uh, helping them to rally around a, a certain number of ideas, uh, sharing, sharing very much the values that Anna has expressed, the value of uh, the values of triple bottom line, meaning how you travel should make a positive impact or, or no impact at all, or, or a positive impact on both the eco economic, social, cultural, natural, I guess that's four different areas, but they have called it the triple bottom line. Um, a place, making sure that a place is as excellent to live in as it is to visit. Um, all of those, I guess what some people sometimes call touchy-feely qualities, uh, certainly lend themselves to, um, well, Valentine's Day, you know, touch and feel in, you know, good, measured, legal ways, um, <laughs> you know, reach out to your loved ones, and the loved ones don't necessarily have to be the people that you know. If you are a person who writes about travel, or a person who promotes travel, or a person who is operating in a way that helps people connect, then foster those kinds of connections. Make sure that people meet people. People should not engage solely with place. People should meet people in a place. Um, it should be that fully fleshed out, fully touchy feely version that brings like minds together or brings clashing minds together and helps them to find common ground, whatever it might be. Something that makes makes it makes it meaningful and personal and rich and full of heart. Thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, Lana, I want to give you the floor. What would you add to this? No, I'm, I'm actually going to take a back seat because I am going to listen to you three and learn this afternoon. So I'm just going to sit and watch and laugh. Well, you, part, you join in anytime you'd like. Um, Thank you. You know, I can't help but um, just be very pleased that on, uh, during the week in which what the BBC said, no all-male comedy panels. <laughs> we have We've got an equal today. quota. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. I, I absolutely despise all of those, you know, those conferences in which it's an all-male panel, and it's like, well, you know, it is to my benefit. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, you know, it just. Wait a minute, you know, responsible travel needs women. 
But the whole um, earth needs women. Sorry. I said we. I, not just in travel. I think we just need a few more women leaders right now. I'd agree with that. Um, I agree with that. I want. To, I'd like to do a, a little bit of a sh uh, screen share and ask if you want. Well, hopefully this will work. And ask if you've if you've seen this uh, web uh, if you've seen this um, website or if you you're or if you're familiar with this initiative. It's called the Empathy Library. Mm-hmm. Has I anyone seen? It. Has anyone? Has anyone seen this? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Uh, I listen quite a bit, of course, to the, the TED lectures and to uh, the RSA there in London. Um, and this work has come out, uh, which is really, to me, an incredible effort that, that is charting and showing how empathy uh, can, be, um, can take center stage in our society. And this is the work of Roman Krishnarik. Uh, uh, I've added the the I've added some of the links to his work uh, on the Planet the Wiki on our RT Week 2014 page. Just mm. this week, he was interviewed by Natasha Mitchell uh, about the Empathy Revolution. As I say, there are quite a few um, videos and audio podcasts of his. He, of course, uh, is also the author of a book of but it's one of the, those touchy-feely words uh, that, to me, is the is the core of travel. You know, we we travel around the world to to experience and to see things that are beyond our horizon, and whether we want to or not, we are often compelled to feel this empathy, and it's one of those emotions that we're not necessarily. I want to say prepared for. Uh, I'm thinking of you know being in Mexico City, being in a five-star hotel uh, that had at least you know five different you know shower nozzles in the shower. It was one of those incredible you know maxed out showers. And you could look out the window and you could see the neighborhood that didn't have water. You know so striking when we see you know the the contrast of uh, if we go beyond you know sympathy or pity uh, and make that human connection, I believe that's the direction that we should be pursuing. You know, I've seen and we've had th this conversation and uh, responsible tourism tourism networking on Facebook. You know, the volunteering and volunteerism. You know, to what degree do those sectors often you know pave the road to hell with good intentions? You know, we're trying to do good for the for the poor. Instead of, I would argue, what we should be doing, which is being empathetic and having actual conversations. Uh, the work that I've done and, and do in Oaxaca, Mexico, is you know, not necessarily provide the promotion and marketing for the artisans, uh, for the weavers, again, for, you know, for the basket makers, but to work with them so that they can you know, take charge of their own communication and the way that their story or stories are told. But, you know, we don't seem to have that empathetic nature in our, in our tourism handbook, you know, either for the visitor or for the promoter. You know, exotic peoples are that, they're attractions, they're products. Or, or they can be people. And we have actual human relations. And how do we move us forward? You know, the local travel movement is a wonderful idea, but it's, to me, some of these ideas seem to be stalling. Your thoughts? I'm, I'm, I'm immediately drawn back to, and I don't mean to toot my own horn or to quote myself, but we had a, a discussion a couple of weeks ago about creating, about uh, social, uh, responsible travel content or, or about creation, creating meaningful content. And what occurred to me during that conversation was how, mm, how I would encourage more people in within the industry, those are those people who self-identify as industry practitioners, whether they're tour operators or PR agents or travel writers or bloggers, um, is the importance of writing about or talking about other people. This goes straight to the 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 notion of empathy. Um, how the more time we take 
we, meaning the people here, but also the people we know, the more time we all could take to present the other, the better off we would all be, rather than being solely inwardly focused and rather than shining the beam on our impressions of other places. And don't get me wrong, there is certainly, there's certainly space for this kind of writing and this kind of uh, travel, um, but the importance of being open to and engaging with and thinking about and showcasing the other forces us to think about how those people we meet live and how those people we engage with see us rather than thinking only about how we are seen, how we see them and how we function in a new environment. Uh, I love the idea, I mean, I, I wish I had used the word empathy when we, spoke and when we spoke before. It goes to the heart of what I think is critical to all of the things that we do, but it can be very hard in a, in a solipsistic industry, one that's very focused on personal experience to encourage people to think about somebody other than oneself. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just the more we get into this, I, I, I think it's Valentine's Day, and you put up a lovely red heart, um, and I think that's one of the things we have to to start to do in tourism is get out of our heads and start to deal with uh, look at this through our heart, um, and. The challenge, we're, we're, you know, the challenge I think is our fundamental set of assumptions about how the world works is based on this notion of separation, that I'm separate from you and I can write about you, I can look at you, I can take pictures of you, um, but you're separate from me, I'm separate from nature. Um, and this is, this is built into, into everything that, that we see and read and do and take for granted. When in actual fact, the opposite is true. We're actually all very connected. We're all one. We're all energy. We're all constantly vibrating. We're beginning to realize there are ways in which we can be communicating with each other that just almost defy all of that Newtonian physics that we've been also brainwashed in. So what does that mean for travel? And, you know, to me, it, it, it's about uh, getting that heart-to-heart, -heart, person to person connection and, and communication. So it's not just writing about people, again, as objects, as to, objects to be studied, um, but engaging the hosts in a community that we go and visit and enable them to be expressing themselves to us, um, engaging in a true dialogue, engaging in a proper conversation. But for as long as we are, we're walking around with that world view, that, that notion of um, I'm separate from you, um, I, I think that's going to be very difficult. And if we're going to make any significant improvements or any chance um, of salvaging um, both humanity and the economy in general and tourism in particular, it's about really getting to the depth of why do we see the world that way is that really working for us? Um, what is the alternative? Um, I don't know if that helps or not, but that's where I'm coming from. I'm saying we can't keep tinkering at the edges. And uh, you know, I think it's fascinating in a way, Ethan, that we have to, you know, we have to have this whole list of adjectives. I'm in responsible, local, sustainable, geo, fair trade <laughs> tourism, uh, because you know, again, that's how we deal with. That's how we make sense of our world. We put it, everything into these separate boxes, um, and yet we're not looking at it as a whole. Um, and that's what's holding us back. I think. I don't know whether that makes sense or not to you, but that's really what I'm trying to do: is to get people to realize just what are the lenses, what are the the assumptions and filters and um, perceptions that are are causing us to behave a certain way. Um, and when we start to unravel those and when we see whether or not they're still working for us and perhaps choose that they're not, then we can start to look at creating some alternative solutions. Um, and one of those will be this notion that we, we do not have the right um, as visitors or even speculators and developers to go into somebody else's place and dictate to them the kind of um, 
way they host up, I think that's where we've gone seriously wrong. Um, I just saw that really vividly in Bali anyway. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm going to sound a bit shocking, but I almost came away from Bali saying, you know, tourism is a, is a very rampant form of um, imperialism. And I'm not the kind of person that normally uses a lot of isms. I don't like that. But uh, I just saw this beautiful island that is where the Balinese, they're very patient, they're very, um, they're incredibly balanced people, they're very wise. Um, but nevertheless, that, that so much of their, their um, island is in effect being trashed by people um, who have no investment in it. So that's the end of my little rant there, but I, I hope I've touched on some relevant um, Ron, who's disappeared. But. Uh, Anna, I want to jump in. I want to, I, I want to, I want to thank you for that comment, and I'd like to do just a little bit of a screen share. I was looking for. Uh, I want to come back to Bali in a second, but I'd like to show you uh, the RTC, the transportation for Southern Nevada, and this is their Twitter account, and we've been uh, tweeting a little bit back and forth. And one of the things um, that impresses me with the idea of connecting and of people and of putting the people first is the fact that we're often not labeling and connecting and not labeling enough. You know, when we, you know, come, come on, what traveler, what visitor is going to be looking at the RTC Southern Nevada Twitter feed? But the fact is, you know, 18 hours ago, they posted a link to a YouTube video that I thought was extraordinary. Um, this is uh, basically just a feature about one of their bus drivers, uh, Frankie Smith, and the way that, uh, of course, we get, of course, we get this advertisement. But this video, which has been viewed nearly a million times, basically shows people uh, the eco-friendly way of visiting Las Vegas and the Strip through the through the public transportation. Um, we're not going to see public transportation featured that much on any tourism portal. In other words, you know what the the imagery that we get from the main tourism portals is what the the secluded beach or the or the long shot of the casinos in Vegas, uh, the happy native faces in anywhere, without that connection and naming of the individual. Not sure why my video is disappearing. Um, and I think if we can push just to a little degree the tourism authorities and encourage people to work with local people and to pay them kudos, I think that would move us forward. You know, once we, you know, once you get on a bus where you know the bus driver's name, that's a different experience. If the bus driver is, you know, greeting people and joking along with people, again, that's a different experience. If you go to Oaxaca and you're, you're trying to, you know, eat through your top ten foods, all right, you can do that. But again, once you know the names of the people, that's a different experience. Ah, oh, there I am. Uh, and again, what I would say is with this new technology, it's 2014, it's not 2014, it's 2004. You know, here's my iPad mini, but when I was in Oaxaca, Mexico, you know, the, the ladies who sold salsa at the market all had a better cell phone than I did. You know, <laughs> you know, I had, you know, my cell phone was a dumb phone. Everybody else had a smartphone. Now, the trick here, like uh, with Mexico, is that, again, the people aren't speaking English. They're speaking Spanish, or perhaps Zapotec, or Mixtec, or Ayuk. And again, I say that not seriously. It's not a problem. But to me, that's the advantage. So if we not just share other people's stories, but if we interact with them, I think that's, that's the way that I would promote that we proceed through this year. You know, if we find that Aboriginal people in Australia are working in the parks and protected areas and would like visitors, then I think it's our job just to be, you know, first of all, to be curious. You know, it, you know I have never been to the Northern Territory, but thanks to uh, uh, Andy Ralph and his family at the Kakadu Culture Camp, you know, I've learned a lot about that territory. And we have these technologies that, again, local people and indigenous people and aboriginal people around the world are using. 
And the, you know, one easy, you know, the the steps to empathy are 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 quite numbered. You know, I'm not immediately going to be empathetic with a person in a country and a culture that I don't know. But this, once we do learn about these people, then we can make those human connections. I am um, a few reactions to that. The first is travel back in the day, and I don't pick your pick whatever day you want. Could be yesterday, could be ten years ago, could be a hundred years ago. Travel in the past has required a certain amount of of social metal, of 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 steel, of 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 spine, because before we knew as much as we know about one another today, you had to be ready to face the unknown. You had to have enough of a sense of self to be able to walk into a place where you didn't have information at your fingertips and be open to working with locals who would help you to feel comfortable in their homes. The whole notion of hospitality is built into a lot of human, a lot of indigenous um, cultures and all, in fact all of our ancient cultures, the ready to accept, the, the readiness to bring in the stranger and to, and to help that stranger feel at home. Um, so the people who traveled were the people who, for the, lo for the most part, certainly not all, but for the most part adventurers were people who had not just the the ability to walk across continents because that was the only way to get where they wanted to go, but also to face the other, and to 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 not to not to want to debate again Anna's important observation that we should not be distinct from the other, but there are still we still travel within our own skin, and when we get to a place, we are we are at the beck and call of others and we do need to try to extend our boundaries so that we all wrap around one another and can work within one another's spaces. Today we have a ridiculous amount of information at our fingertips. The commoditization of travel has been one moving us from adventure in where it isn't about facing down your fear of the unknown, it is, it is giving in to your curiosity for the other. It is giving in to your curiosity about things that you don't live, things that you don't taste every day, things that you don't experience every day. And I think we've gone through a, we've gone through a kind of a dip, a low point there, where we went from the adventurers of the past who had that strength of spirit to be able to go to new places, to the curious of today who are extremely well informed and eager to meet and understand those other experiences. And the low place in between is this industrial complex that, that Anna has talked about where there was a lot of information about where we wanted to go but people weren't really interested in engaging. And I do think we're, 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 we're on that upslope back to, back to engaging our passions and, and feeding our curiosity. And I do think, Ron, counter to what you said, that the efforts, our efforts, our collective efforts in this space to shift thinking, I do think they're 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 meeting with. How do I want to say this? I do think that our efforts and consumer curiosity is finally is finally pushing the needle to places where destination marketers and tourism boards are responding. In the conversations that I've had of late, in talking about the importance of working with the right kind of quality and relevant content. Uh, in talking about destination marketing and destination marketing practices in general, tourism boards and individuals within the tourism board, the tourism and destination marketing structures, they do know what the consumer wants. They do know where people are valuing these authentic experiences. They do want to meet the bus driver and know his name. They do have this information, but it's cutting through all the noise to get at that information. It's helping people to find the profiles, 
so that they can learn the names of the food of the, of the women in the market in Oaxaca. It's it's getting it's we're in, we're in a place where instead of not having enough information and trusting our instinct or trusting adventurers, we have too much information and it's just about getting the people to the right kind of it's not just but one of the things is getting people to the right kind of information. One second. And feeding uh, that second. curiosity by providing it with the right kind of stuff. Lynn, Lynn or Anna, do you have a response to that, or shall I take Ethan on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is there going to be a fight? <laughs> no. Healthy, healthy discussion. Put him up. Put him up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can. I'm happy to let you take Ethan on if you want to. I don't. I don't have an issue with what Ethan's saying. I think the. Um, I think there is definitely a recognition uh, among the tourist boards and DMOs, and even even the large, you know, some large corporations about the recognition that the sophisticated Western traveller, in particular, um, is is a lot more curious, is a is a lot more desirous of of meeting people, having encounter meaningful encounters. Immersing themselves in experiences, um, you know, using all of their senses, um, you know, entering into a into a new territory, body, mind, soul, and spirit, and, and engaging all of their faculties in that sense. Um, I, I see it everywhere. I mean, uh, in, I think it was the Intercontinental in, Intercontinental Hotel Group that had a big thing on um, on working with locals. It's as if they're sort of riding on the back of that local trend that. Has, has come up from the bottom and the big corporations are realizing that they've got to customize and personalize. Um, I think that's that's starting to happen and I, I find that very encouraging in a way. Um, so, um, you know, to me it's it's moving in the right direction. Um, but there are also, we're, we're sitting on a tsunami of demand in terms of people wanting to, to catch up in terms of travel. Um, and I'm the the sort of mass industry, the sort of mass tourism, is all too keen to embrace these these expanding markets, but there isn't that level of interest as as far as I could see uh, with those new travelers. They're still seeing seeing places as trophies. They're still um, you know places to be photographed in and not necessarily to be fully experienced. And I think that's also raising other issues of compatibility. So you've, you've got a very sophisticated Western market that wants these immersive experiences and doesn't consider themselves to be tourists. None of them want to be called tourists. They all want to be called travelers. And then you've got another huge market that's exploding of people that have every right. If travel is a right, then they have as much right to go traveling as I and you do. Um, but their motivation and their... Um, their ability to, and this sounds condescending and I don't wish it to, but their, their, their experience is such that they're not, um, they, they, they want something a little different out of their experience. And that I can see where there's, there's some conflict starting to grow. But, you know. Um, Sorry, Anna. Yeah, no, I'll stop. Did, did you, by that, by, the, by the, the travelers who have every right to travel and are living something, I mean, I don't mean to pigeonhole people, but are we talking the new generation of middle class Chinese and Indian and Russian travelers who have a very different perspective? Or? Yeah, I mean, what I'm seeing now is, in, uh, I just came back from Bali, and um, again, you know, you've got now this enormous diversity of visitors arriving in a, in a place, which is presenting a whole set of new challenges to the host. Um, because some of these visitors are, are not necessarily compatible with each other. Um, they don't like each other. I mean, you know, I won't say too much on air, but but they just, you know, we've got issues around that. Um, I, I, and I said, I, they have as much right to travel. I actually personally don't believe that travel is a right. I think that's where we've gone really very wrong. Um, travel is a privilege. Um, and because we've just we've now you know maintained that it's a right and everybody can do it we've not thought through the consequences of that when i travel for me it's an utter privilege to be traveling um i don't expect to be able to do it forever and certainly 
for much longer because of other factors. But, you know, that's a secondary issue. Don't want to get off the point. I'll let you have a go, Ron, if you want, or Lynn. Exactly. Well, you know, get off the point. What point is there? You know, one of the... One of the great things of, uh, you know, my take on Responsible Travel Week and online conferencing is the idea that really not much is planned in advance, and that way nothing goes wrong. <laughs> uh, but I would like to, you know, I would like to go back to what Ethan was saying and, and agree or disagree, uh, focus us. We, we often talk about uh, the experience, you know, experiential travel and this immersive environment, but we usually look at that from the viewpoint of the visitor, of the traveler. You know, I want to, you know, go to a weaving class or a ceramic class. I want to go to a food class. How do we you know, do these things? But rarely do we see uh, how the, you know, we rarely do we perceive this from the point of view from the local. And I think there are some very specific suggestions we could make to those who are traveling and those who are promoting travel that could benefit the locals. You know, often, we're, as I say, if we look at the experience, what about the experience of the local? Uh, for a traveler, if it, again, if it's a checklist, I want to do these, you know, 10 things, fine, you can do those things and you can do them quickly. I remember in Oaxaca where I began a, a serious dislike of a, of a friend um, he said, oh, the tule tree, the tree that has the widest girth in the world. We can do that in 10 minutes. You know, when you can do travel, <laughs> I have a problem with it. Just like on the volunteering, on the volunteering board. It's like, has anyone done the street children of Ecuador? <laughs> what do you mean done? And they're not talking about, you know, they're not talking about any um, you know, nasty sexual encounters. They're just talking about helping those poor people. Well, wait a minute, what do you mean doing? Uh, if we turn it on its, on its head and say, all right, let's take a look from the locals. Now, you know, we of, you know, of, of um, European English heritage, you know, we have a certain dialogue in this particular hangout. If I have a conversation with my friends in Oaxaca and Ecuador, or if Anna has a conversation with the Balinese, you know, that's an entirely different conversation and one that I would really encourage us having and sharing. But we need to be putting that focus, again, on that local experience. And I think that's something that we should be promoting to the tourism boards. Rarely do I see a tourism board taking an idea that's come from the community. All right, that, that I will it's continue. usually hoisted onto the community. And show me I'm wrong. No, I, I, I just want to applaud you for saying that, Ron, because I think that there you're getting now to something that has some, you know, to me the crux of the matter, that in most cases, tourism is not, it's completely out of the hands of the real true host. Because tourism is now a multinational uh, juggernaut, in a sense, um, and you know, tourist boards are there to promote visitation. They're, they're there to promote to, to, to promote numbers. Um, I haven't seen that many tourist boards really work um, systematically with ordinary everyday people in a community and say, what, what kind of tourism do you want? Um, this is, you know, this is to me the, the crux of the issue, and I'm glad you've raised it. Um, so I don't know what you think about that, Ethan but, um, and Lynn, but you know, to me, community self-determination is probably the most important factor going forward. How much do, are we preparing places? I mean, as you know, I've worked a lot in Samoa, or I've been to Samoa, uh, as an example of a beautiful island in the South Pacific, which has got absolutely stunning uh, tourism assets, um, and a, an opportunity to go in two directions as far as its development is concerned. Um, but who is really asking and, and engaging Samoans to decide, to give them an idea of what their choices are and to, to give them the ability to make wise choices based on quality information. Um, and that to me is where the real um, opportunity and need lies 
uh, around the around the globe at the moment is places which have got those choices still to do it in a way that will give them long term benefit and higher levels of return to the host community um, or not, as the case may be. So I, I, I do agree with you on that point, Ron. The challenge with this conversation is that we're using the word we a lot, but we haven't really defined which role we're playing. Um, you know, there are four of us sitting around um, four computers in various parts of the globe having a wonderful conversation right now. But I think to make it really meaningful, we need to, to perhaps define, you know, who we is and what the role is and what the challenge is a little bit more tightly. But you know, as you say, it's just a nice conversation on a Friday afternoon, so that has to be too serious. But um, you know, I, I feel we're not going to get too far unless we start to. to oh, we are we among us four. We're not going to get that far uh, as far as we us four would like to go. And that's going to require, you know, broader, broader participation. But luckily, we have our networks in place. And, and again, I would ask that if we could figure out broader we, we could broader, broader we could figure out. Again, we need, you know, to me, we need better trade conferences. We need better tourism promotions. We need better uh, consultation. But come on, we've all we've all seen, you know, the consultants go in and do some sort of report on, on uh, tourism potential or tourism assets and again that report is what? It's written in a language that locals can't understand and no one has access. Uh, those are serious problems that uh, that restrain us. I would like to propose, you know, and again this is just a wild idea, but you know we need some award for the, the tourism boards and promotions that, that uh, do buck the trend and that are you know, seeking that input from the locals. You know, I see far too many tourism campaigns that you know, seek out the, the foreign blogger to come to a place to talk about their, their merits, but I see very few programs in which, again, they, they reach out to the locals and say, you tell us what you'd like us to do. And I think if we would, you know, we need to have those kudos to the people that are doing it. And my, you know, in my example that I was showing with the bus driver, you know, you're going to see that from these niche sites, but it's not going to be promoted necessarily from the Las Vegas Tourism Bureau. That can change, and we'll see these things develop in the future. Ethan, excuse me. Got so many things to say to that. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. There are countries, large and small. And I would say that smaller countries like Samoa are with, and this is, I, I, I smiled and winced a little bit at Anna's use of the word tourism assets, as I, I know she used I don't it purposely. like it either. Okay, I'm saying <laughs> it's, it's old language, but it, you know. Uh, no, 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 I know, I know. It's just the whole notion of, you know, the industry and the economy, and here we are talking about, here we are talking about using using language that does need to be reformulated and you have been at the forefront of of the push to try to get people funny to think that about it. term isn't it I mean I don't I don't, right. I'm, I I'm not I it's funny that I would use a term that ordinarily I would really detest um it's just it shows you how when you get into these conversations these old ways of thinking no matter how you may wish to change it still keep them bubbling up you know sure um, so I, I need to throw three three thoughts out just in, in the into the general mix that that came to mind as a function of what has been discussed. The first is I spent a year in Sri Lanka. Uh, the year, unfortunately, that included the tsunami, um, and so I arrived in September. The tsunami was Boxing Day in December, and then spent the remainder of 1995 um, writing for a number of different places about what had happened, but also working with local nonprofits and local uh, community organizations to try to figure out how best to move forward. I was looking at it through a tourism lens because that is the space in which I exist, and there was a lot of effort put into trying to balance community redevelopment against big industrial complex development taking into account the natural needs that had been put into very stark display, whether or not everything should be set back 100 feet from the shore, 200 feet from the shore, 300 feet from the shore, 
Should individuals be allowed to build closer, even if it meant that large high-rise hotels would be looking out at local local habitation uh, at a further distance from the water, and lots of things that were taken into account. And I watched the move in the wrong direction, and it was very, very disheartening, where community outreach and community effort, which was considerable at the time and well-funded because every single development organization in the world was present, um, helping with the restructuring, with the rescue, the re rebuilding, the rehabilitation. Um, the community outreach and the community consultation was considerable, and those were, and those considerations were reported to the government and to private industry and to developers and all the rest of that. But slowly over time, those community interests were were stomped out by the power of large brands, large developers, government wheel and dealing all the rest of that. What we're looking at and what we, and, and by we, when I say we now, I'm going to use Ron's we for, what we're looking at, what we're talking about is a problem that is not limited to the tourism space. When we're talking about power and influence and manipulation, this is stuff that spans all industries and all economies and it's, it's a much bigger problem. How we grapple with it in the tourism, in the tourism space is important because we are dealing in some cases and in some ways more with people than we're dealing with experiences rather than products and building things to service those experiences rather than just selling products. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that that we're not we can't just silo in, uh, in tour travel and tourism when talking about the bigger problems of the way the world works. That's one one important thing that I wanted to say. The second thing is you brought up the question of where are there examples of things that use the power and interest of community to elevate local experience regardless of what comes down the pipe or what, what directions are being dictated from above. And I do have to give a shout out, I believe, to the Travel Festivals initiative that was started by Ronnie Weiss, New York Travel Festival, where the baton was picked up by our good friend Martin, uh, who had the Mossel Bay Travel Festival, and now there's a Johannesburg Travel Festival that's going to be taking place in others in other parts of the world. Uh, the second New York Travel Festival is happening April 26th and 27th in New York. This was an initiative that tried to say we can talk about travel by anchoring it in a place and taking into account the interests of the people who live in that place and, ha and trying to find the link between the place and travel and international interests as well. We're, we're trying to, and I say we because I'm on the organizing committee, full disclosure, of the New York Travel Festival. We are trying to work with people who engage with locals who are locals in New York and want to put forward an image of New York in the greater New York region so that people who come into this travel festival who want to get excited about travel in general, capital T, um, but also want to think about it in a way that we think is healthy and responsible, can do so in a frame that takes into account the interests of locals. And that is why Travel Festivals, the larger brand, is always looking at how people in a place can represent travel in that place, even though it's in the larger brackets of travel in general. That's why it is the New York Travel Festival, and the Johannesburg Travel Festival, and the Muscle Bay Travel Festival, because the festival and the things that are being talked about, the inspiration, the sharing, the, the, the planning, and all the rest of that, has to be in a place and you can't lose sight of what that place is. So I would like to put that forward as an example of how mindsets are changing and people are taking initiatives and we are raising the profile of this kind of thing and we're putting a lot of the larger brands and larger festivals on notice saying you can't do it the same old way. I will be at ITB in two weeks. Do I want to be at ITB? I want to be at ITB because I want to meet the people that I don't have a chance to meet. But do I want to be at ITB because it's ITB? No way. <laughs> same old crap, same old thing, going to be dealing with the same old enormous enormous things. It's, it's, it's vast. It's huge. It does bring people together, and there is value in that. But maybe we just need to redo it and have just an opportunity to bring together people who are trying to move and shake and change and build. Second thing. The third thing is I recently learned about an initiative, for example, here in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Chambers of Commerce are trying to... Add, bring new vigor to the to the Brooklyn travel space. There is a Visit Britain 
website, but they're trying to do build a new website called Explore Brooklyn, um, explorebk.com. And what they're what they're part of what's driving it is the neighborhoods of Brooklyn and the extended faraway neighborhoods, the Sheepshead Bay, the Cypress Hill, the places that nobody ever goes to because it's too far away from what NYC and Co, the New York City Tourism Board promotes. Here's Brooklyn saying, we've got richer, more, we've got more rich value, we've got more excitement and more, and more beauty to share, but the only way we're really going to be able to make it happen is by going into the neighborhoods and getting the interest of the people in those neighborhoods, the local bloggers, the local businesses, the things that a chamber can do because of its business connections, and elevate the identity of those individual neighborhoods to show the magic tapestry that is Brooklyn in general. Now, it's a part of a city in a big city, in a state, in a country. But these things are happening because I have had discussions with other tourism boards, regional tourism boards, national tourism boards, where this notion of authentic experiences can be translated into local experiences. They want to know, they want to profile the individuals. Travel Oregon has a very good website where they have local experts, where they're elevating the profile, the image, the experience of the local. It is happening. It's slow. It's painfully slow. It is fraught with peril and it is littered with mistakes, but it is happening and it is such an improvement on where we've been. Well, I, I, I just want to echo that. I mean, I, I agree with you, Ethan. I think it, is, it, it definitely is happening. I said that before. Um, and I love the examples you're giving. And the, the core message with conscious travel is, is, is again, it's about this notion of uniqueness of each place and how do we how do we engage the people in who have all the stories have all the experiences participate in in celebrating and ex, in expressing the uniqueness of place and that's popping up all over the place which is the reason that I say you know cautiously optimistic about the future because I do see a lot of change a change happening and I'm I'm you know the irony is we're, we're speaking Oh, we're preaching to the choir because I think we're all of a similar mind here. Um, but I would have exactly the same approach to the ITB. Is what I'm interested in is, is, is collecting the stories of places and people in places that are starting to take back a degree of control over their own destiny. And you've just given a couple of examples of that. But I think we need to somehow collect those examples now. So the places which are a little bit lacking in confidence that they could do that will gain in confidence and uh, have the tools with which they can start to express their vision and live their vision for how they want to receive visitors in the future. So, you know, I mean, I think we've got reason to celebrate this, this shift. As you say, it's not universal yet. But it's actually bubbling up at a speed that I don't think any of us could have foreseen a few years ago. Uh, and that's a reason to be positive uh, on a wet and soggy Friday afternoon. <laughs> you know, in Las Vegas, we're expecting, I, I don't speak Celsius, but uh, we're about to get to 80 degrees today. It'll be the warmest Valentine's Day in, in recorded history here. So, again, warm weather travel and some of the warm weather travel here in Las Vegas, uh, and it's February. Can you imagine what the temperature will be in August? Well, I mean, that jet stream could just swing around and change everything again, so you just reach, there's no way of predicting anything anymore. Yep. It, doesn't, it doesn't follow that because it's hot there now, it'll be hotter. We just don't know that it's living with that degree of uncertainty, which is a huge factor that the tourism industry is going to have to take into account over the next few years. But that's another topic altogether, and I suggest we don't go there. <laughs> Anna, I, 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 not today, but I do want to take on tourism and climate change with you uh, in the future. I, I think it's one of those great topics that should be motivating us and should be connecting us, and you know, just simply hasn't you know, generated the support that we need to have a proper discussion. I, do, uh, I will just say this right now. I'm listening to our own conversation this afternoon, and, and just I don't think there's a, a fundamental understanding of the fact that we cannot we cannot continue to grow tourism at the rate at which it's growing um, 
the pace at which it's growing and assume that you could just do that forever. And what's worrying me is that everywhere I go, uh, I'm seeing these outrageously um, optimistic forecasts of growth. I don't see any of the major parties, you know, the leadership within the tourism industry really saying, is this growth model at all sustainable in its own right? In, in other sectors of the global economy right now, there is a recognition that we should run out of steam, we cannot continue to grow. But in tourism, is there that collective understanding? That's the topic I think for conversation. Because if we don't get to that, really deal with that issue of, of constant growth, and what would an alternative look like and how might we get there? I, th I just think we're, we're tinkering at the edges. We're having a nice conversation, um, but we're not we're not being responsible in, in the sense that we're maybe not looking at the big elephant in the room. So it makes my metaphor. Any other final comments from you folks? And we'll wind this up. That was a Can final I question. <laughs> Can I say something? You're allowed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I always uh, try and run my life with joy in it. Having been in a big black hole and lost everything and started again, you relish and realize who your friends are. And I just celebrate that fact every day. And I, I go with... Sir Winston Churchill's quote of, I am ever the optimist, there doesn't seem much point in being anything else. And to the travel industry, I found, I've, I've never quoted the Bible in travel before, but I must quote this, it's from Hebrews 13 verse 2, and it says, do not neglect hospitality, for through it some have unknowingly entertained angels. And it's just, it's just make everyone special, make everyone feel special, and just love life. It's that's me. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Ethan, any final comments? I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to change the ending. Lynn just, Lynn just no. gave me the ending. Nice ending. Everybody, I want to thank you for your attention and your time and your love and your curiosity and your generosity and your empathy. Uh, this has been. Uh, our conversation, and uh, we will continue these hangouts uh, in the future, and we will continue to fight the good fight and make good things happen when and where we can. Uh, for those who are watching later on, uh, your comments are welcome on our YouTube video, and for the guests as well, you're you are welcome to post the links to any of the resources or or suggestions. Um, I'll be curating and aggregating and collecting the the good tidbits and putting them on the wiki. And again, I think this is the way of compiling the good practices and, and sharing it with the people that, uh, that, we, that we love and admire. So, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh. Oh, sideways heart. There we go. That was a terrible one. Yeah, this is special effects. We're, we're, we're sparing no great. We're sparing no great. <laughs> You don't want to do this kind of thing that everybody does these days? If I yeah. could really do it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, and we'll end the broadcast here, but this conversation certainly continues. Thank you, everybody. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. My, my.